Hi, Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor, a CLL patient myself, the executive vice president, chief medical officer, and co-founder of the nonprofit CLL Society. Jan, you want to introduce yourself? Thank you so much for having me. So my name is Jan Leifman. I'm a U.S. trained MD, also a clinical researcher with a background in immunotherapy, immuno-oncology, gene therapy, and most recently COVID-19. Thank you for having me. Dr. Leifman, uh, you've uh, studied one of the big existential issues of our day, COVID-19. And for me personally in the community, we serve the cancer community who seems to have a disproportionately high impact of this disease, tend to do worse. And But you have some ideas about why that is and uh, maybe you could share some what your uh, studies have told you in terms of why cancer patients are more impacted by COVID. Yes, thank you. So cancer patients remain an at-risk group for COVID-19 due to their immunocompromised status. Their reduced ability to mount a strong immune response and potentially reduced ability to make antibodies even after mRNA vaccination. So they remain also at risk for hospitalization and even death. And for this patient population, they remain a very vulnerable population. In a recent study from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, they showed that 1,400 patients with blood cancers showed insufficient response to COVID-19 vaccines, where only 75% of all patients were able to produce antibodies to uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so in essence, that leaves uh, the 25% of very vulnerable patient population. In another study, specifically in multiple myeloma patients with COVID-19, only 16% of these patients develop no detectable antibodies after both vaccine doses. I'm so, sorry, only 16 60- 60% develop no detectable antibodies, just saying it's only 40% develop. I missed that. Oh, sorry. Can I repeat that? Please, yes. So, in a recent study done in multiple myeloma patients, almost 16, 16% of these patients developed no or minimal antibodies after they received both mRNA vaccine doses. Thus, this further confirms that they remain a vulnerable patient population. As of this recording, uh, there is no general consensus on what to do. And this largely remains a case by case situation. And so patients should really speak with their physicians about the next best steps as their physicians know their other medical conditions, what medications they're on, what cancer they have and what therapies they're undergoing. And that is the best route forward to help uh, hopefully offer these patients some form of respite as they are a very vulnerable patient population. And I would just echo what you say. This has been the main thrust of what the CLL Society has been doing for the last year is looking at this issue um, because we were hoping the vaccines would be a savior. But chronic lymphocytic leukemia, as you know uh, well, and so do our listeners, is a cancer of the immune system. And uh, we are the poster child uh, children of not responding to the vaccine. So the data from various studies shows anywhere from between um, uh, 40% to 75% of us form antibodies uh, after vaccination, uh, which are generally less uh, robust than that in the regular population. So we remain uh, potentially unprotected and some of us clearly unprotected uh, post-vaccination. So how to solve that problem and be able to re-enter the world is a big issue. Now you've done some uh, personal research at some potential therapies and you mentioned to me you had three different options that you wanted to discuss that uh, need to be researched to see if they make sense, but uh, you're excited that they have a potential if it if they pan out and Uh, clinical trials. Can you share with us some of the ideas that have you excited as a researcher? Thank you. So the first one is a drug called molnupiravir. So this is an antiviral medication 
that is currently in phase three clinical trials. Their phase two clinical trial data demonstrated high effectiveness uh, where patients who received it at day three were discharged from the hospital by day five with minimal to no symptoms, and they were essentially COVID free. At the moment, Regeneron's monoclonal antibody cocktail remains a highly effective therapy, but cost and access can be hurdles for patients. The hope is that molnupiravir can circumvent these hurdles while continuing to deliver high efficacy for prevention and treatment of COVID-19. The second therapy I want to speak about is mesenchymal stem cell therapy. Uh, so just a brief recap. So this therapy um, was actually one where as the director of the immunology division of the global COVID task force, our team was one of the first to demonstrate uh, its efficacy mechanistically. And we were proven correct by companies within that space. And then one company got US FDA fast track designation on December 1st, 2020, a week before the vaccines. Now I know what you're thinking. What the heck is this and how does it work? So mesenchymal stem cells are stem cells that can be derived from placenta, umbilical cord, fat, and bone marrow. This therapy has antiviral capacity, meaning it can stop the virus from replicating. It has immunomodulatory capacity, meaning it can reset the immune system. I call it the reset switch for the immune system, where it turns off the pro-inflammatory pathways, turns on the anti-inflammatory pathways, and as a result, it dampens the cytokine storm, as we like to call it. And then it also has regenerative potential, whereby the organs that were damaged uh, by the virus and by the cytokine storm are essentially regenerated, healed. Um, and it had shown very promising data in Israel where they took seven patients with severe COVID-19 with multi-organ damage and they made a full recovery and remained COVID-free even at the 28-day mark One follow-up was done. And then the University of Miami had their own study where they showed that patients under the age of 85 exhibit 100% survival by day 30 with promising results after three month follow-up. Now with that in mind, um, uh, the, one of the companies, the company that got this US FDA fast track designation, Mesoblast, has continued to show promising data and hopefully they will approach the FDA soon and see uh, what the next steps are to hopefully getting this therapy uh, to the masses, so to speak. And then the third one that I wanted to speak about is called Zofin. So this is a therapy that just received FDA approval for a phase one, two clinical trial in COVID-19 long haulers. This therapy uses exosomes, which are extracellular vesicles that carry proteins, mRNA, and microRNA, and they can regulate and block genes involved in inflammation. Now, long COVID to this date hasn't been fully characterized, but what we do know is the latest studies show that it's a condition of chronic inflammation. And this approach uh, is very unique and has the potential to block this chronic inflammation. Now, uh, once again, it's just entering a phase one, two clinical trial. So at this point, we're really assessing the safety and soon we'll assess the efficacy, but it's something to watch moving forward. It's an innovative concept uh, and because of its potential, it also has the potential to be affordable as well. So something to watch moving forward. It's very exciting and we certainly do need uh, better therapeutics. Um, you know, I personally uh, am a, a, a big believer in the monoclonal antibodies. Um, uh, I think that they're the best hand we have to play today um, that's available to us, um, at, at depending on the timing and following the guidelines. But I also think we just need better antivirals. I mean, if we could get antivirals into people early before the virus takes off, then the inflammatory phase isn't going to happen if there's no infection to trigger it. So we just need better antivirals. And we were able to do that um, uh, decades ago with the HIV uh, 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 problems that we uh, faced as a community. And it may need that we need multiple orthogonal uh, treatments uh, coming at the virus from different sides 
but um, it's not nearly as mutagenic a virus as the HIV. So I'm optimistic that we'll get to some antivirals and I'm very excited about the options that you're sharing here. Uh, any final words, Dr. Leifman, that you wanna share in terms of uh, COVID therapy? So I feel like we're in a better spot than we were a year ago. We have more options, we have access to vaccines. And you know, I just spoke about three th therapies uh, there potentially could be more and hopefully uh, together we can get through this pandemic and I'm hopeful that in a year we will be in a much better place than we are today. So science is doing its job, innovation is happening and the most important thing that we can do is have hope, continue to practice safety measures like social distancing, mask wearing and uh, taking care of ourselves. Uh, Dr. Leifman, you and I are on the same page. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having me.